Hello, I'm Pastor Mary Beth, and this is the Tremplo United Methodist Church. This is October 24th, 2021. I'm going to be reading the scripture for you this morning. I'm actually on vacation, um, but Jamie Ocasco is going to offer a beautiful message for you after I read the scripture. So um, today, this is about Moses. The story is about Moses and um, his conversations with Pharaoh in trying to get Pharaoh to let the people go from, from Egypt. So hear these words. It's actually from the book of Exodus, and it's paraphrased and quoted. After speaking with Israel's leaders, Moses and Aaron went to see Pharaoh. They told him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, for they must go out into the wilderness to hold a religious festival in my honor. Is that so? retorted Pharaoh. And who is the Lord that I should listen to him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Again, Moses and, Pharaoh went to, and Moses and Aaron went to see Pharaoh, and they performed a miracle just as the Lord had told them. Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his court, and it became a snake. Then Pharaoh called in his magicians, and they did the same thing with their secret arts. Their staffs became snakes too. But then Aaron's snakes swallowed up their snakes. Pharaoh's heart, however, remained hard and stubborn. He still refused to listen, just as the Lord had predicted. This miracle was followed by plagues of blood and frogs, gnats and flies, livestock hail, locusts and darkness. But still Pharaoh's heart was hard and he would not let the Israelites go. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will send just one more disaster on Pharaoh and the land of Egypt. After that, Pharaoh will let you go. In fact, he will be so anxious to get rid of you that he will practically force you to leave the country. So Moses announced to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, about midnight, I will pass through Egypt. All the firstborn sons will die in every family in Egypt, from the oldest son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the oldest son of his lowliest slave. Even the firstborn of the animals will die. But God had Moses tell the Israelites to paint the blood of a lamb on the doorposts of their homes so that, so that the angel of death would pass over their houses. So the people of Israel did just as the Lord had commanded through Moses and Aaron. And at midnight the Lord killed all the firstborn sons in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn son of Pharaoh, who sat on the throne, to the firstborn son of the captive in the dungeon. Even the firstborn of their livestock were killed. Pharaoh and his officials and all the people of Egypt woke up during the night, and loud wailing was heard throughout the land of Egypt. There was not a single house where someone had not died. Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron during the night. Leave us, he cried. Go away, all of you. Go and serve the Lord as you have requested. The word of our Lord today. And now Jamie will offer you a message. Hello, my name is Jamie Okusko, and I'll be delivering today's message, October 24th, 2021. We're looking at the first section of the book of Exodus. The... Uh, Ten plagues of Egypt are no small feat. Over the course of many weeks, Moses and Aaron go to the Pharaoh on behalf of God, pleading for the Israelites to be set free. The plagues come in the following order. Water turning into blood, frogs, lice, flies, livestock pestilence, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and then, of course, the firstborn sons dying. As the scripture tells us, each time a plague came, the Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he refused to let the Israelites go. For centuries, people fully believed in and invested in the biblical description of these events. Two historical incidences, though, however, began to change those views and led to a lot of questioning. The first was the manipulation of Christianity during the medieval time period, which read, eventually led to the Reformation by Martin Luther in 1517. The second is the introduction of the Scientific Revolution, which lasted from 1543 until 1687. As a result of these two events, people began to, to really question the miracle of the Bible. 
For individuals who had grown weary of being told that they would burn in hell for so many countless of reasons, and then people were weary of paging for indulgences to be set free from their sins, science comes in and just gives them a breath of fresh air, a reprieve from the continual guilt of simply being human. Science provides convenient answers for the possible possibility of how the plagues came to be. Some scientists claim that that Moses didn't turn the Nile into blood at all. As a matter of fact, the three most popular theories all start with debunking the first plague. In a Time Magazine article titled, Did the Ten Plagues of Egypt Really Happen? Author Olivia Waxman compiled the three major theories, one of which is old-fashioned climate change. Another argument is that a, a red algae had sucked all the oxygen from the river, causing the frogs to vacate and die caused the insects to come and the dead animals, which led to human beings trying to clean up the carcasses, which of course led to boils and sickness and so on and so on. In order for that uh, order to be substantiated though, um, the, the red algae theory points to the fact that algae actually has to flourish in the first place. There needs to be a slow sludge of warm water, it says. Well, in 2010, researchers on stalagmites Elongated mineral deposits that form out of calcium and precipitation suggested that there had been a dry period towards the end of the reign of Pharaoh Ramus II that would have dried up the Nile, significantly slowed down the flow of water. This is according to a paleoclimatologist, Augusta Mignon. Another theory presented by a microbiologist, Sirio Trevinthio, hypothesizes this. The plagues were the fallout of a volcanic eruption. Winds would have carried the volcanic ash to Egypt during the summer at some point. The toxic acid of the volcanic ash would have included a mineral called cinnabar, which then would have been capable of turning the river into a red-like blood color. The accumulation of acid in the water would have caused the frogs to leap out and search for clean water. Insects then would have burrowed the eggs in the bodies of the dead animals, human survivors then, which generated larvae and adult insects. Then came the volcanic ash into the atmosphere, which would have affected the weather. Acid rain would have come down, landed on people's skin, which would have caused, of course, boils. The grass would have been contaminated, poisoning the animals who ate it. The humidity from the rain, the subsequent hail, all created these optimal conditions for locusts to thrive. And because of volcanic eruption, it explains that there would have been several days of darkness which means nine of the 10 plagues are accounted for. Of course, the argument that the firstborn son died is convenient as well. Well, the firstborn sons, as you all know, are responsible for going to gather the grain from the community granary for the family's dinner. Because of all the plagues, the dead animals, the insects, and so on, their fungus has started to grow. And when the firstborn went to collect the grain, they stirred up the dust and breathed in the fungus, and of course died. Although it doesn't really account for how the firstborn animals died. It also doesn't account for how the Pharaoh's son died. Because believe me, the son of a Pharaoh is not going to be given the menial task of going to the granary to collect grain for the family meal. Science seems to sum up all and give us all the answers. Oh, <laughs> Right, the parting of the Red Sea. I want to forget that one. Um, a very long, stiff wind came up and made that happen. In the well-known words of Dana Carvey's ever-popular SNL character, The Church Lady, how convenient. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not here to discredit the work of scientists worldwide. What I am here to suggest, though, perhaps, is it wasn't as convenient as some people would like to think it is. Let's start with Moses. We are told in Exodus and reminded again in the book of Acts that, that Moses was born in Egypt. He was cast out at the age of three months and was taken in and raised by the Pharaoh's daughter. When he's around the age of 40, he came back. Um, it, it came into his heart to go visit his brethren and children in Israel. Upon his arrival, he sees an Egyptian cruelly, viciously beating um, one of the Israelites. And as a result, he kills the Egyptian and buries him in the sand. And so when Moses tried to encourage the Israelites to leave, their response was, 
Who made you the ruler and the judge over us? Will you kill us like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? As a result, then, Moses leaves and went to Median. <clears throat> Another 40 years passed before Moses, at the ripe old age of 80, <laughs> encountered the burning bush and the Lord's request to go to Egypt and free the Lord's people, the Israelites. I mean, just to be clear, Moses is 80. 80. When he went on the greatest mission of his life, I would venture to guess the word convenient didn't cross Moses' mind at all. In fact, he actually pleaded to the Lord not to go. He said he wasn't smart enough and he couldn't speak well enough to go, to undergo such an important journey. The Lord's answer, take your brother Aaron with you. Now, how many of us have faced trials in our lives at the most inconvenient of times? We're, we're comfortable in our job. Management decides that they wanna make a change the unexpected sickness of a loved one, Dissolve, dissolution of a marriage. And we try to, and we struggle to understand why. Why now? Throughout history of mankind, life literally happens at the most inconvenient of times. Many of us have suffered at the hands of inconvenient fate to the point where we are beyond frustrated and angry. Much like Moses, perhaps what we need to see are events through different eyes. In our current time, we have the benefit of reading and seeing the biblical stories in their entirety from beginning to end. We have the gift of hindsight. Because the plagues God set against the Pharaoh, that the firstborn son would die. While the Israelites were instructed by Moses to put the blood of the lamb that they had sacrificed over their doors so that the angel of the Lord would know to pass over their homes. The Egyptians were given no such reprieve. It is the death of the firstborn that convinces the Pharaoh to set the Lord's people free. Now fast forward through the Bible and you will be reminded that Jesus, the firstborn son, the lamb of God, was also sacrificed during the Passover so that the Lord's people could be set free from sin. And that is a sacrifice, however, that lasts in eternity. Matthew 26, 39 also reminds us that Jesus, like Moses, felt that he wasn't right for the task before him. And going a little farther into the garden, he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Moses was 80 when he went into Egypt, foretold those ten plagues, and helped the Israelites flee, flee from the Pharaoh. Jesus was in his early 30s when he too pleaded with the Lord to let the cup pass from him, both knowing that the Lord's will must be done, however. Jesus willingly embraces the cross for our salvation. Both of them knew, though. While we may look for convenient and easy logical answers for life's inconvenient circumstances, the truth is because we have the faith and unfailing love and the guidance of the Lord Jesus Christ, we truly can overcome the most difficult of tasks. Perhaps it's not convenient at all that the lasting stiff wind came up right when the Israelites needed to cross the Red Sea. And maybe it's not convenient at all that that stiff wind stopped just at the right time to sweep the Pharaoh's army away. Perhaps, just perhaps, the Lord our God created that wind for the purpose of saving his people. Perhaps what we see as our greatest obstacle is in fact the Lord's way of working miracles through us. Amen. May the Lord bless and keep you this week in safety, in happiness, and in love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, go in peace. God bless.